Um, thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, my name is Julie Evershed. I'm the director of the Language Resource Center, and we collaborate quite a bit with the Department of Comparative Literature and various translation initiatives. And our big one is starting this evening at 5.30, and I hope you all are signed up and will be attending. It's the Translate-a-thon. Um, we have a record number of participants signed up, 239. Last count, we had over 28 languages represented. I've got over 260 some odd documents and videos that need translating. So there is a lot to get done this weekend. I'm so excited to have everybody here. And I'm especially pleased to welcome our colleague, um, Professor Laura Donna Valetsi from University of Cardiff. And I'm really excited to hear her <coughs> talk this afternoon because I think it's really gonna relate to what we're doing here at the LRC. I'd also like to mention and welcome our colleague, Elisa, who's a professor of translation in Brazil. You might see her, there she is. <laughs> she's actually, um, when she was on campus, she's attended our Translate-a-thon, and now she is joining us virtually to participate, and she's also collaborating with Marlon's class. So we're really excited to have Elisa here this afternoon, um, and all of you. So I will turn it over now to tomorrow. <laughs> I'll just be I'll just be very quick. I'm Mardo Salas, I'm the postdoc uh, fellow in critical translation studies at the Department of Comparative Literature. And it is my pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce to you our guest speaker. Um, I have had the privilege to work with her some years ago when I was still doing my um, my doctoral studies in Melbourne. So that's the part of, of, of um, of, of putting the connections out, yeah. and, and because she was one of the founding academic directors of the Migration Identity and Translation Network, um, which is an initiative, a research initiative on translation between the Mon Monash University in Australia and the University of Warwick in the UK. Um, at present, she is um, a, professor, a professor of translation studies at Cardiff University and the president of the International Association for Translation and Intercultural uh, Studies. Her work focuses on geographical and social mobilities um, and how these uh, are connected to the theories and practices of translation, self-translation, and multilingualism. Together with my PhD supervisor, Rita Wilson, she is also the editor of the International Translation Studies Journal, The Translator. So please help me uh, in welcoming Professor Loredana Polenz. Well, um, it, it's an honor and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, gracias, grazie, and Dios, if you want the Welsh for that, though I don't speak Welsh much beyond that. Um, it, it's a pleasure, I'm grateful to Yopi and to Marlon in particular for inviting me here. And I have to say from the start that I am suffering from absolute full-blown uh, envy, um, both for the Translatathon, which I'm really very much looking forward to visiting, to having you know, a peep, peek at later on today and perhaps tomorrow, um, and also because of um, the fantastic initiative which in a sense this translator tone and, and partly this talk are in preparation of, which is you know, my congratulations to, to you as a group for getting a, a Melon Sawyer um, seminar on sites on translation and on the multilingual Midwest. I, you know, I congratulate you in advance and I know it's going to be a phenomenal success and a fantastic thing to do. Now, I promised to talk about language, justice, social cohesion, and of course, you know, what, what you're doing here, both of the examples I just gave, the Translatathon and uh, the, the Mellon Sawyer seminar, are very much um, at heart about language, translation, and community. So, let me start from this. Um, you'll know that map. We were talking about um, Australia, um, you know, the, the collaboration between my, older, more, my old university, Warwick, and Monash. I'm sure you know that map. It's the Aussie map of the world, the world upside down. Okay? It's the same world, but from a different perspective. So on that map, let me ask you, how many, were, uh, how many of the 193 member states recognized by the United Nations Okay, there are 193 today. How many of those are multilingual? Do you know the answer? 
193, it's a perfectly rhetorical question, yes. <laughs> but every single country in the world, there isn't a single country, however small, which is totally homogeneous when it comes to language. And yet, in spite of that, we still live, in spite of all the evidence, we still have to deal with a series of myths, a series of myths that affect the way that we think about language and therefore also the way that we think about translation, but most of all, of all the way that we think about ourselves and who we are. The first, um, it, these are not my words, they're definitions that come from others. You've got the names at the bottom there, Alastair Pennycook, Yasmin Yildiz, David Gramling. So the myth of monolingualism, the myth that the norm, the standard, the normal way to be is to have one language. And with that, the myth of English, the myth of English as the international language and as possibly perhaps the only language that we will ever need. I'm an Italian, I have spent uh, most of my adult, well, all of my adult life really in the Anglophone world and I get constantly, as a, you know, spent it in the Anglophone world as a teacher of languages, as a specialist in language and translation and I constantly get faced with that question. Okay, but why should we study languages when everybody speaks English? Well, do they really? And, as I was saying to Marlon this morning, another way that I put it is, yeah, we all learned your language and don't you want to know what we're doing with it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and other myths that I will get to um, in a moment. And so we also, as, um, as a discipline, modern languages within that translation, but we live in kind of permanent crisis. There is always, especially in the Anglophone world, maybe only actually in the Anglophone world, there's this sense that what is the point of modern languages? And I suppose within that, you know, or, or around that, there is a sense of what is it that we as um, specialists, as scholars, but also as people who live in the humanities are bringing to society today? And I think what I want to talk about today, for me, is very much my answer, my way of saying we need to be out there, not only because it's important for us, but because if we don't speak about languages, if we don't speak about the way in which we communicate, then there is a question of value, there is a question of social cohesion, and there is a question of how we live together, which is very much lost. Um, it was, I don't like it that much actually, but I always quote it because it is actually effective. It's a few years ago, Sigurd Bauman wrote down that the heroes of today's world are the interpreters and the legislators, and that our imperative, our, imperative, our common um, social imperative is converse or perish. I don't like the negativity, I don't like the kind of ominous sense in that. But it is true that conversing, understanding each other, is uh, the imperative of our world, of any <coughs> world, I imagine. So, I said more uh, myths or more tropes, if you want, about language. Language is easy to misunderstand, for one thing, because we swim in it, we breathe it, we live with it all the time. So we don't have to pay attention to it very often. But language about language, that's the other problem. We can only use language to speak about language. And so we end up with meta-language. And words are important. So think about this, mother tongue. What does it mean to talk about mother tongue? Now, I was saying again earlier today in a conversation, sometimes it is strategic to use this word. It is important to defend, for instance, minority languages, languages at risk of extinction. Yes, of course. But there's something odd about that word. When we say mother tongue, we are reinstating and somehow naturalizing, giving almost a biological uh, grounding to the idea that the norm is to have one language because we have one mother. And just like we have one mother, we have one language. And, and this is, um, it's conducive and it's, it's part of, if you want, that ideology which is associated very strongly with, um, with the myth of the nation. So another myth. Sorry, I, have a, I wish I had Obama's ability. I have a little fly that's flying around me and I can't get, a, get, get rid of it. So if you see me flailing a bit, it's to get rid of the fly. <laughs> um, but, you know, that, that idea of uh, one nation, one language, one culture, which was at the core of 19th century uh, nationalism in particular, and which keeps returning today as we constantly see uh, populism, nationalism sort of coming back uh, on the political agenda again and again. 
But think about it. Is it really the case um, that we only have one mother, that we only have one language? I told you already, of the 193 nation state um, recognized by the UN, all of them are multilingual. But the beauty is also that it all depends on kinship systems, doesn't it? I was discussing this uh, with some colleagues in Namibia a couple of years ago, and one of them looked at me and said, but you see, it doesn't work, does it? Because in our kinship system, you can have more than one mother, because your mother's sisters are your mothers, and so why shouldn't you have more than one language? The person who's put it best, that myth, the myth of the mother tongue, is um, Sheldon Pollock, um, leading scholar of Sanskrit in particular, where he said that it is only in the Western modernity, in the um, era and the age of the nation, that the idea, it's his words, not mine, of a mother tongue to be loved and never betrayed in all exclusivity was born. So we have to do something about that. And that's why I don't like, even though I'm happy to use it strategically, I don't like talking about mother tongue. That's the other one I've got a problem with the native speaker. Well, you know what? Nobody is born speaking. We're born with the <coughs> ability to learn and to speak a language. But language is what we learn, and we learn it through socialization. And depending on how we socialize, we will learn a language or another language, or more than one, more than one language. And yet we talk about the native speaker. And I'll talk a little bit um, later on also about what um, the way in which we need to rethink the way in which we do language pedagogy. Think about this. The myth of the native speaker means that every time we start learning a language, or every time we have a class of students in front of us who want to learn a language, and we place that image, a figment of our imagination, because nobody speaks a language perfectly besides not being born speaking it. Nobody absolutely speaks it perfectly. It's a bit like the ideal speaker of, of formal linguistics. You don't really have someone who never makes a mistake, who never stumbles, who knows every register, etc., etc., etc. But every time we set up that image of the native speaker as the goal of language learning, we're effectively setting up all of our students, we're setting ourselves up to fail, because we're not going to become, become that. So for me, um, I want to take that away and put something else in its place. What linguists do best, I have to be careful about how I say this because I, I, I sometimes use this as a joke and I said, well, you know, if you want to create another native speaker of German, Spanish, um, whatever language, there are other ways to do that. But what linguists do other, actually, what distinguishes us from others is the ability to move between languages. That's what we do best and that's what makes us particularly useful uh, and, and what we can contribute to society. But that means that translation is actually what we do best, even when we don't think that what we're doing is translating. A little bit more again about that late, later on. The other thing that I want to ban from our language, no, I don't want to ban, I don't want to ban anything. I'm not particularly um, sort of dictatorial like that. Um, but the other thing that I don't particularly like, and certainly I don't use any longer, is the notion of foreign languages and that label. You know what? Go back to that map, that upside down map. Languages are not foreign. They're always already here. We live in multilingual societies. And the majority of us, actually, in, especially if we stay away from that idea that in order to have a language, you have to be like a native speaker, the majority of us are already multilingual. We don't have to cross a border. We don't have, to go, um, don't have to go overseas. We don't have to go into another territory in order to encounter languages. And they are not um, foreign to our communities either. And yet, that kind of negative um, discourse about languages and about multilingualism, which sees speakers of other languages as suspect and sees them as not us, not part of our community, um, is persistent. I've used a map there which is from the um, early 20th century at the time of the First World War. Um, I've used it also because, of course, Europe uh, at its center and at its borders is at present being pulled in all kinds of directions um, uh, which are conflictual, very conflictual at present. I'm an Italian living in the UK, so don't start me. Uh, 
But it's also to talk about what language stands for in these uh, debates, in these discussions. Very often what happens is that because of the instrumental nature of language, because it's easy to say, well, you know what, if you're living in this society, well, we need a language in which we can communicate. And, um, and so, you know, if you are here, you have to speak our language, whatever our language might be. And as a result of that, often what you see is that languages are being used to talk about something else. They're being used to talk about without talking about race, ethnicity, religion. Um, there's a colleague, Anne-Marie Fortier, a sociologist originally from Canada. She's worked on Italian migration to the UK. She's now working on a, a concept, an idea that she calls citizenization. She talks about the way in which language is precisely used to determine who's a good and who's a bad citizen. So very often citizenship tests are, to all intents and purposes, language tests. But what does language do there? And she talks about the fact that we jump from a judgment which is about practical, instrumental ability to use a language, to a judgment which is about something else. It's about moral values. And the way it goes is this. This is her, not me. If you come to live in my community and you don't learn my language well enough, then you're not showing enough desire to be like me. And therefore, you're a bad citizen. So there's a shift here, there's a, there's, a, there's a slippage that goes from, are you capable of speaking a language? And by the way, am I giving you the instruments? Am I helping you to learn this language? Am I um, supporting your ability to become a member of this community through translation um, and through interpretation and through language learning and all of these things. Am I doing this or am I just expecting you somehow to turn into me? And, and that, I've put an example there which comes from the UK. Baroness Casey, um, in 2016, so, um, sorry, no, 2018, in uh, March 2018, went on record saying that the UK, this is someone who was for a, a, a number of years the um, uh, social cohesion, the integration guru of the um, um, UK government. So it's someone who has a strong commitment and a, a, a lot of knowledge, um, uh, presumably, about uh, social cohesion. Um, and, and social relationships. And she went on record saying that the UK should set up a date by which everyone in the UK should speak English. Now, listen carefully to what she said. She didn't say everybody in the UK should only speak English. But the slippage is very quick there. And what she was read as meaning, but to be honest, if you read her declaration, what she was probably also looking forward to or desiring, if I can use that again, is precisely a country in which everybody speaks the same language. I can promise you, among other things, it didn't go down well in Wales, which is, since the, lang the Welsh Language Act at the end of the 20th century, officially a bilingual country. And, and of course, not just a bilingual country, but a multilingual country with many other languages uh, besides that. But it's that slippage that is also really interesting. Now, this is one of my favorite quotations ever, together with the Sheldon Pollock. I've put it there in the original Italian, but I can translate it for you. Antonio Gramsci, philosopher, um, who uh, was incarcerated and died in prison um, at the hands of the fascist regime in Italy. And he wrote a lot about languages. He started actually as a linguist in his university career. And what he wrote there is that every time that, one way or another, the question of language raises its head, what is really at stake is a different kind of issue. Issues that have to do with the formation and the broadening of the elites and with the question of cultural and political hegemony. So every time we think about language, we may think that we're only talking about this instrument, this tool of communication, but language is never neutral. And the examples I've just given you about citizenship and citizenization of language uh, are about that. The other effect of this 
paying little attention to language or this normalizing of the idea that one language is enough and that actually it's normal to have precisely only one language, is that we think of people who speak lots of languages as exceptional. That is from um, 2018, again, uh, from um, The New Yorker, and it's about the mystery of people who speak dozens of languages. Okay, fine. Dozens of languages probably, yes, it, it starts to be a bit mysterious. But there's no mystery about people speaking more than one language. Actually, we all are capable of it. Um, it's perfectly normal to have more than one language, and I'll show you some examples of that later on. Now, in order to start getting people to think about these things, so to stop them from ignoring language and ignoring translation, but also ignoring those preconceptions and those myths, I started asking people in, in, in talks like these or in my classes uh, all over the world, okay, you know, what's your definition? Like a Twitter-style definition of translation, or what's your language you know, um, repertoire? If I do that, and when I do that, what happens is that people start saying to me, again, it's the question of the meta-language about language, they start saying to me what they think that I want to hear, and what they've already learned to say about these things. So I got fed up with that. And I am now asking people to draw it. So I give them a blank piece of paper, I go around with, she with, piece, you know, with sheets of paper, I give everyone a piece of paper, and I say to them, okay, just draw it. Draw a map, draw whatever you want of how languages work for you and how translation comes into your life. And they look at me blankly and panicking for about two minutes and then they start drawing. And I've learned, by the way, if you try this trick, do not ever give in to the request of can you show us some that someone else did before. Because if you do that, then everybody does the same. So no, just say, you know, I'll show you later, but not before. Now with you, I'm not doing the trick, so I'm showing you something that they did earlier. So one of the things that I get all the time are things like this. And this is probably the most common metaphor today about translation. The idea that translation is a bridge, a bridge between two islands. Now, interesting, sure. Um, the idea of transfer, translation as transfer, fine. But what, again, it keeps reinstating is this idea that languages, cultures, um, selfhood, you know, uh, subjectivity are sort of islands and that they're completely separate and then translation comes in and translators comes, come in and build the bridge and bring things across. Fine, true, but A, there's also a myth then that translators are the good guys, that they always do the work of good communication and, and friendship. Well, as Mona Baker, one of the specialists in translation, has written repeatedly, friends come over bridges but armies do too, so not necessarily. But also, when people start drawing this, I love this one because this person started with those two islands and then started, okay, but there is this and there is that and there is the other and I don't even want to analyze what's in there, but it gets complicated. That's my point, okay? This is another one, sorry, let me, hello? Yes. Oh, has it gone too far? Yes. This is another one. This was done by uh, a colleague of yours at Montclair University last year. And one of the things I love about this one, you can see at the start there, English, but English plus Spanish because they're really quite close to each other. And then you can see things happening, you know, German. Russian is a bit stuck on a limb. But the rest, what I love about this one is that it started in that corner and there's way to go. Okay, there's still all the space for these to grow. I'm not a psychoanalyst, I don't want to psychoanalyze these things, but I love the way in which iconographically I haven't finished this journey. There is so much more that you can do. Um, this is another one which I think is also from Montclair. And I love, lots of people put themselves at the center. You know, they do a stick image, they do a much better drawing, or they do like that, just a little, you know, symbolic, a triangle there. But you are here, so I am here really. And then around that you have, you know, you have Portuguese, you have Spanish, you have Russian in Massachusetts, but you also have this room which is the vortex in which I live with my boyfriend and all of these languages get sort of whirled around and mixed and, and at the bottom there's the angry face because apparently she is learning Chinese and he's finding it very difficult so he's jealous about that, <laughs> okay? So you can see also how this gets really personal, it's part of who we are, how we socialize. And my favorite picture about translation so far is this. So in this particular case, I wasn't asking so much about the map of languages, but represent translation. And this 
wrote, person wrote down this. So language is the oil. This, this is somebody actually, uh, it was someone who was uh, from the US but, but studying in the UK. So you got apologies for the placement, um, product placement there because Tesco is one of the super mask markets that sell petrol in the UK. But he was saying, talking about oil because you know it's the American English that comes in there. And so the petrol of translation, the oil of translation goes, sorry, the oil of language goes into the car, which is translation. And where is it going to take me? To culture. Because why it's five miles away, I've never known, and don't ask me, I don't know. But it's this idea that it's taking me places. It's not just allowing me to um, transfer something, but it's taking me somewhere else. It's giving me access to something that I wouldn't have access to otherwise. And that is what is fundamental for me and what is part of the role of translation at social level. You'll be familiar with these, um, you know, the sustainable, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. At the heart of that, there is a famous philosophy, it's become famous by now, no one left behind. Well, how do you not leave anyone behind if you don't think about language, if you don't think about multilingualism, if you don't think about translation? I will, again, tell you what my action plan is about this. What my action plan? What, what I, uh, I, I, it's an action plan I've shared with, with lots of people. But I think it's fundamental that whatever we're thinking about, whether we're thinking about poverty, whether we're thinking about um, climate action, whether we're thinking about sustainable cities and communities, we think about the language experience that goes with these things and how by making languages visible or invisible, by making translation and interpreting available or not available, we are effectively driving an agenda of inclusion and exclusion. Um, an example of this, a very practical example, um, on behalf and only on behalf of IATIS, of the um, International Association for Translation and Intercultural Studies that I am currently president of, I'm one of the signatories of an open letter which the Red T organization, you may have heard about them, so just like there is a Red Cross, uh, there is a Red T, and the Red T organization sent an open, let an open letter uh, last May to uh, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations asking, calling for a resolution that protects translators and interpreters in areas of conflict, the way in which um, the Red Cross or journalists also are protected. And um, if you want to know how unprotected they are, how much this is needed, and again, how the fact that we don't recognize the role of language because we don't see it means that people are abandoned, uh, you can do worse than watching, there's an episode, if you put, um, um, you know um, Simon Oliver last week tonight? Yeah. Okay, John, if you put, John Oliver. sorry, John Oliver, uh, John Oliver, sorry, I always get it wrong, John Oliver last week tonight, if you put in John Oliver last week tonight and interpreters, you will get a whole episode of that program about how interpreters are left behind. And it starts with the picture of a donkey and it says, you know, I'm awfully sorry, but by the end of this program, I will make you hate this donkey. And the donkey, of course, has no, um, you know, no, no fault in, in this. So a little bit about how I got into doing all of these things. So um, there's a, 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 I will leave these slides with, with Marlon, by the way, so if anybody's interested, you can get to these. But for the past few years, I have been involved with a project called um, TML, Transnationalizing Modern Languages, uh, which is a terrible name. But they basically, when we put the proposal in, um, we said we want to do all this stuff and we had a different title and they said we love this and we'll give you two million pounds but uh, you have to change the title so we, based, we said we'll call it whatever you want. Okay? <laughs> but it's known as TML and then TML Global Challenges. But this was a project which was about the Italian diasporic tradition and the Italian diasporic communities around the world. And we used that as a, I almost would like to say a, a Trojan horse, but a way to study uh, the way that languages travel, the way that cultures travel, um, outside a purely colonial or imperial model. There is a little bit of history and, and a very infamous history of uh, colonial history um, for Italy and even three or four years of imperial history. Um, but nevertheless, that's not the model of the Italian diasporic communities. So we did that, but in doing that we were trying you know, always be ambitious. We were trying to change the DNA, we were saying, of modern languages. Rethinking the way in which we teach languages, we think about languages, we think about translation. That took us to lots of places, but it took me on a um, theoretical detour. And I want very quickly to talk about um, a, a couple of theoretical things before giving you some examples. Now, 
translation or multilingualism. Now, um, and, and we can talk about the multi um, and, or, 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 or plurilingualism or, or other things, but let's stick with multilingualism. I often use that picture, Chinese, Italian, and say, okay, please tell me, is this a case of translation or is it a case of multilingualism? There are ways of thinking about these things as very distinct. Multilingualism here and translation here, and even you know, as different strategies politically, multilingualism or translation. But actually, in practice, there's a continuum of these things. I don't think you can say, you know, this is translation, this is multilingualism, and one excludes the other. I discussed this picture with um, a, a, a dear colleague who's uh, Renier Grutman, who uh, works in Ottawa, who's a Belgian, who works in Canada, and he was saying, translation and multilingualism are like two sides of the same coin. They are similar, but they never touch. And I was saying, no, for me, it's a continuum. You know, you have so many practices, and all of us sometimes lean more towards one or lean more towards the other, but they're not mutually exclusive. So I've started talk to talk about and to think about this idea of a translation continuum. At one end of that, you have translation in the old-fashioned sense, okay? Here's a text, source text, written in a language, source language, belonging to a culture, source culture. Here comes an interpreter or a translator, and they transform it into another text, which is a target text in a target language in a target culture. You'll be doing this in the translatorton. But I bet you, you will already find in those, some of those texts, uh, in some of those 260, I think, you said they were texts, that people are already using multiple languages within that text. Okay, so it's not as clean cut as that. And when we speak, when we live our lives, you know, I, I talk also of translation as the fabric of our, of our lives. I say to people, take away everything that involves translation from your life. Um, from what you read, from, I don't know, the, the driver who drove you here today, what was their first language, um, the, the people you meet and the way, you know, those maps, how many times in a day do you switch languages or do you mix languages? So I talk about the translational fabric because I think translation is deeply woven into who we are and what we do. If you start taking it away, I, one of the examples I use with my students in Britain is to say, okay, who's the most famous um, author ever in the history of the English language? Response? Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Now, take away from the whole of Shakespeare's earth everything that he couldn't have written if it were not from, for translation before that. No sonnets, no classical plays, no Hamlet, no Romeo and Juliet. Carry on, there's hardly anything left, okay? So I talk about this way of thinking about translation more as a continuum and not as a substitution that involves an erasure, you know, erasing the place where we started, erasing the source text, and now substituting it with an equivalent target text. And I'll return to it a little bit later. But think about the, the, the places in which we live. This is a picture I took in San Francisco. And think about the linguistic landscapes around us. I haven't had the time to walk around uh, on Arbor or to go into Detroit. But I bet if I walked around, I could take pictures such as this. This was in the space that used to be Little Italy in San Francisco. So lots of Italian there, but also a trace of that colonial past that I was telling you, for instance, Masawa restaurant. Um, the Horn of Africa is the place of Italian colonialism. But also, the fact that this abundance of languages is not a problem, because we're constantly told it's an issue, it's a problem, it's a cost, we have to pay for translation. Do you know, by the way, how much uh, each European uh, Union citizen pays every year? What the cost is for the whole of the EU, and, and the EU translates an awful lot. Do you know per capita how much it costs to each European citizen in Europe each year? I have it from a European Union officer from Translation DG. Two euros per year, per person. So that's the cost. But we're told we can't afford it. Well, stop thinking about it as a problem and think about it as an asset. Language creativity is a phenomenal. A colleague with whom I work, uh, Gabrielle Hogan-Brown, who's hating me at present because I'm behind with something I need to do for her, um, she talks about linguonomics, the economics of languages, and how much, actually, we can also produce, reduce poverty, precisely, with languages. But I just look at that and I think, Gigi Sottomare Oisteria. 
Isn't that fantastic? The way in which we can be creative with languages. So an osteria, the Italian word, which becomes oisteria because yes, you can go and eat oysters in there. So think about the creativity of what we do. And I was saying earlier, we need to rethink then what it means in terms of pedagogy. Translation is not about grammar translation, about teaching someone to use correctly the subjunctive. And communicative language learning, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal movement in language learning, but which expunged translation, just like it, um, it expelled the use of the home language from language classes, is really not doing us any favors because it doesn't allow us, as I was saying earlier, to develop that ability, which is the real ability of linguists, to move between languages. So we must rethink this in different models. And alternative models are about mobility, about additive by your multilingualism, so not, again, de deleting one language or excluding one language from one person's experience. You migrate, you should no longer speak this, you now speak our language, but also from the classroom. Why can't we have two languages cohabiting our classrooms when we have languages cohabiting our lives? But another way in which here in particular in the US, um, different approaches to translation and to language learning are being revived is the movement towards um, translanguaging and towards intercomprehension. So, Last year I was at California State University in Long Beach. It's a Hispanic serving institution. 35 plus uh, percent of students are Hispanic speaking. In language classes, actually, it's a lot more than that. Does it make sense to teach these students Italian or French, another Romance language, uh, ignoring the fact that they are Hispanophones? It doesn't compute. But orthodoxy is taking that direction. So translanguaging as well. Translanguaging is more than code switching. The fact that the idea that we use different repertoires of different languages that we have at our disposal, often moving fluidly between one and the other, almost as if they were one repertoire. And for some of you, I'm sure, around this room, for me as a person in my personal life, that is the case. You know, if you look at my shopping lists, you know, I start in English and then something drops in in Italian and then it goes back to English and then something else. That's how I live. Um, we have an experience of these things. So translanguaging, as I said. And the additive model. I mentioned to, to Marlon um, Giolo Bianco this morning. So it's Giolo Bianco and Francois Cran, two other colleagues, who came up with this idea, the cod model. And they show you the fish so you'll never forget it again. They were talking about maintenance. You know, if you have uh, linguistic communities, which, um, um, you know, especially migrant communities, which are enclaves, we know from migration history that unless something intervenes, what happens is the first generation arrives either speaking a bit or not speaking the host language, and then they uh, learn, again, depending on socialization, better or worse, more or less, but they learn, they learn that language. They maintain the heritage language as well. The second generation learns the host language, uh, the host community language, and they have some knowledge again, depending on how it's, they're socialized in the family, but they maintain some knowledge of the heritage language. But the third generation, unless something intervenes, that heritage language gets lost. So they were thinking, okay, what are the factors that need to intervene? What are the, the, the components that ensure that a language can be maintained? But I think this is a way of thinking about additive multilingualism more generally, not just in migrant community, in communities, but certainly in migrant communities. Now, the C is capability. If you never learn to speak a language, to use a language, you will not be able to. The second one is, the O, is opportunity. If you don't have other people, if you don't have environments, places where you can use that language, even if you learned it a bit, you're going to lose it. But can you guess what the D is? Yeah, it's desire. And desire is fundamental. If your language is not desirable, if you're made to feel ashamed by using your language, if there's no place where it is valued and where it is seen, if there's no artistic production, if there's no um, youth culture, if there's none of these things, why ever would you want to use it? And this is the key. If we want to build a society and a system of education that actually encourages and sustains additive multilingualism, we have to have that desire, and desire goes with desirability. Uh, we have to construct that kind of model. 
Now, I've told you, I'll tell you, I'll give you some examples. So I've been working through that project, a bunch of Italianists, we ended up, amongst other things, working in sub-Saharan Africa. I'd never been there before, but through uh, the Phoenix project, an engagement project of the University of Cardiff, I've been working particularly in Namibia. And I always talk about this as in serendipity and how to find it. I don't believe in destiny, but I believe in serendipity, but you have to be alert to finding it. And I arrived in Cardiff, someone introduced me to a colleague who's a um, professor of anesthesia, and she said, oh, we've got this project with medical humanities and, and, and well, no, with the medical uh, field in Namibia, we're looking to collaborate with the humanities as well. And I said, okay, Namibia, I know a few things about it. I'll show you about Namibia in a second. But one thing I know is that it's highly multilingual. You're working in Namibia, how do you deal with that? And she said, you're coming to Namibia. And then we started working together. Now, the Phoenix Project is not about language, it's about health and it's about poverty reduction. But I have been working with scientists, with engineers, with legal experts, with in particular the medical schools and medical experts on the fact that language is key to all of these things. And to tell you that, let me tell you the history of Teresa. Teresa Chivera is a young anesthetist. Um, until five years ago, there was no medical school in Namibia, so every single doctor in Namibia was either a Namibian trained outside or someone from outside coming to work in Namibia. Um, Tereja is, is Namibian who was trained in the United States and in South Africa. Her first language is Rukungali, uh, the second one is Afrikaans, and then English. At about 15, she was in a medical center in rural Namibia. She suffered from um, malaria, and there was just a cloth between her and the patient who was being seen before her. And she said she could hear that the doctor, who didn't speak Rukungali, and was going through an interpreter, who was a nurse who happened to be there and happened to speak some English and Rukungali, um, the doctor was being was misunderstanding what was going on and what the woman was saying was being misrepresented and she said by the end of that the woman went away with medication for something she didn't suffer from and I decided I needed to become a doctor. She might equally have decided to be a translator I suppose. So when we work now Namibia at the bottom there um, this is the symbol I've learned to do for, you know, it's, it's what Namibians look like um, you know do when they, they do Namibia. It's, it's also the, the, the one that famously um, President Trump couldn't pronounce and pronounce Nambia. Um, so, um, but lots of languages and very variously distributed. Um, a very complex landscape of indigenous languages, ex-colonial languages. 7% of the population still speak first language German. Another 7% speaks uh, Afrikaans. Uh, a similar number speaks Portuguese. Um, Oshiwambo is the largest indigenous language. Uh, but at the moment of independence in 1990, they decided Going for that as the national language would mean privileging the majority ethnicity over the others. And so in terms of social cohesion, this would not work. Politically, going for one of the ex-colonial languages, <coughs> German um, or Afrikaans, would also be extremely difficult and not particularly uh, a, a clever or a socially acceptable move. So what did they do? And I know someone who was in the room when those decisions were taken. They went for English, of course. They went for English because English is the language of modernity. They went for English because it was not a colonial language in Namibia, but because it was perceived as the language that they would take them places. Problem is, the moment you, so it was a democratizing move, but the moment you democratize this way, you start creating differences this way. And so 30 years later, Namibia was <coughs> independent in 1990, so pretty much 30 years. 30 years later, what you see is the professional classes identifying all more and more with English, and the rural population being left behind. You know, that no one left behind. And then, what happens in the medical school? So in the medical school, which is now open at the University of Namibia, well, all the students are trained in English, and so they identify professionally. Remember, this is not their first language. It's often not their second language. They may speak five languages, but they identify professionally with English. And so, well, I'll tell you so in a second. So we do now, we work in, the key word for us is sensitization. And we work with future doctors, but we also work with young children in uh, primary schools, trying to encourage 
the children and the parents to think that the indigenous language are still important, just as important as learning English on the other hand. Because the same person can say to you uh, within two sentences, my child must absolutely learn English, but it's so sad they can no longer speak to their grandparents. So we're losing so much. So how do we maintain that? But we're also speaking to doctors. And with doctors, this is a picture that I, that, uh, I, I took while I was asking in one class, how many uh, people in here speak more than four languages? Okay? When you say one language, nobody. Two languages, a couple. And then three and above is, is the majority. So we do sensitization with them and we do um, workshops, practical workshops. Um, we, we do things like um, um, simulations. And at the end of one of those simulations, at the end of one of those workshops, one of the students said to me, this is really interesting, I've never thought about it this way, but every time that I go and do um, a work experience in a hospital, uh, in a health center, and I have to ask for an interpreter, remember this is you know, someone whose native language is probably Oshiwambo or Oshirero, or, um, but who's professionalized as a doctor in English, she said, every time I ask for an interpreter, my exact words are, I need an interpreter because the patient doesn't speak English. What does that say about my relationship with my patients? And for me, the moment someone says something like that, I'm done. It's clicked. She is now thinking about language and she's thinking about she's positioning herself and she's thinking that even though she's not even an English native speaker, okay, yet, English is professionally what she thinks others lack. So the lack is with, um, with the, the patient. And we've got some phenomenal comments from doing these workshops. You know, things like, okay, translators struggle to be neutral. How can you really be neutral? I could tell you hundreds of more stories about the, the ways in, in, in which these, these workshops um, and role plays have, have um, brought things up. The fact that, yes, it's difficult to um, translate uh, terminology, specific scientific terminology, but actually what's even more difficult is the cultural part. How to approach people, how to do that. Um, questions of gender, uh, questions of, okay, if you have an interpreter there, and this is a country in which there are no qualifications for interpreters and translators, the interpreters and translators you will have there are what we call natural interpreters. If you're lucky, a nurse, as in the case of Teresa, but often also a member of the family. Will a mother be happy to talk about whatever is happening to her um, in front of her son? Maybe sometimes, but not in other cases. Right, almost finished. So the question of culture, and I want to stress this. Another story that Teresa told me is about uh, working with a consultant who was from outside and who was working in Namibia. And this is a consultant anesthetist, and that person, she noticed, apart from immediately after surgery, was not prescribing any pain relief to his um, patients. And eventually, she picked up the courage, and she asked him and said, OK, um, how come you're not prescribing anything? And the answer came back, these people do not feel pain. Now, the translation of pain, Marlon, you were probably still there. We did a whole conference about the translation of pain in Monash. But the translation of pain is a very, very important cultural issue. But if you don't know how people encode pain, if you don't know how they express it, if you don't know what the taboos are, for instance, in making it visible or verbalizing things, you may think, and of course it's a very racist statement as well, these people do not feel pain. So, when I say translation is more than language, that's what I mean. What next? Well, we're, we're doing a series of things. Uh, we're now embedding this kind of training in the training of all students of the medical school in Namibia at UNAM. Year four, two, before they go on a placement. Year three, before they go on a rural placement where we're, they're definitely going to, in, um, to encounter languages other than English. And we're now doing staff training. I want these training sessions to be independent of me. So we need to train the trainers so that they can continue to produce this. But we're also bringing it back home. Because it's not only in Namibia that hospitals and health centers are multilingual places. A hospital here in, in Ann Arbor and in Detroit, a hospital in, in, in uh, uh, Wales or in the UK, is one of the most multilingual places you encounter on Earth. So now, one of my colleagues is doing it actually next week. Uh, we're doing sessions for staff and trainees at Cardiff as well. 
Okay, I want to finish by, and we're also, you know, we're going beyond this now. We're work, also working with Zambia, with working with Uganda, um, thinking about these questions of hierarchies of prestige, thinking about questions of desire, thinking about the role of international languages, thinking about, okay, do we need to translate the specialist terminology? The first thing that a medic or a lawyer will tell you is, I need the terminology in. It's like, no, you don't, because you're training your doctors in English. And the technical terminology you need for the doctors, what you need is how culturally you can use narrative to tell the right story to the people you, you're talking to. And so that's again where we as humanities people have to be there and have to think about, it's rhetoric if you want the old fashioned name, okay? If you want effective health, public health communication, you need to talk to us. That's part of what we're saying. So again, back there. Not perfect translation and erasure and substitution, but instead a translation that is cognizant and uh, aware of the way in which we live language across different spaces and different, and different uh, tongues. Which also takes me back to the work that I do on migration, because migration, migrant writers, migrant artists are the greatest self-translators. And one of the things I've learned by working with them is that they absolutely don't believe in, but also they would abhor the idea of translation as erasure, of translation as now you have to cancel, delete who you were, and you have to become someone else. It's the opposite. Translation is about co-presence. It's about memory. It's about trace. It's about maintaining the trace of who you were in who you are now. I was speaking with a, a colleague, with a, a, a writer um, who is based here in the United States, come from um, ex-Yugoslavia, and he was saying, Translation for me is the history of how I became who I am. Okay? So this idea that it's not about the raising and substituting, but it's about maintaining a trace and a traceability, which is also about, therefore, hospitality. Hospitality is, is, is a tense term, but translation is also a tense term. An ethics of hospitality is an ethics of translation, but an ethics of translation in which I don't ask you in order to be my guest to delete who you were, but rather it's about maintaining that traceability in change. And there is an ecology of translation in, in all of this, um, not just in the sense that we need to be careful, I was making that example earlier with Namibia, not to lose so many languages um, all at once, as in an ecological disaster. But also an ecology of translation in the sense of how do we build that model in which additive multilingualism, in which desirability of multiple languages is, um, is part of our environment. So I've learned from colleagues such as Shirini Ramzanali Fazel, who's a Somali writer who started writing in Italian, then self-translated herself into English, uh, when she self-translated herself into English, she started rewriting sh what she'd written in Italian. Ngugi Wathiongo has written eminently and eloquently about this. And then as she was rewriting herself into Italian, she was going back and changing the English again. And then, because she'd done all of this work, she started publishing her work bilingually. And then she started doing, uh, with us in our project, multilingual uh, writing workshops. And through those multilingual writing workshops, which we were doing in the UK, we then took her to uh, Namibia. And we did some of those there. After the work in, done in the UK, she published a book of multilingual um, poems, which she wrote in a third, fourth language, English, but then self-translated back into Italian. They're mostly about cultural uh, untranslatables from the different cultures she moves within. And then someone else took the Italian and translated it into French and, um, and developed a theatre and musical performance out of that. But the translation didn't stop there. Um, in Namibia, these are the proofs, I don't have the book yet, but when I was in Namibia last in September, out of the writing workshops we did with her, students and staff were inspired to then write an anthology of multilingual poetry. Those are the proofs. And this is what I call the ping-pong theory of translation. I no longer judge a translation by how faithful it is. I don't care. What is important is how productive it is. Like that Shakespeare 
analogy, okay? But something like a ping pong ball, a translation goes and hits somewhere and then it bounces off again in a different direction. Maybe even comes back, as in the case of Shirin. The English translation made her look back at the Italian. But if not, it continues to produce, to produce culture, to produce connectivity um, in other places. And the last example I want to give you about ecology is uh, Filomena Coppola, an artist of Italian descent working in Mildura, center of Victoria in Australia. And this installation, which he calls Wallflower, Mirror and Mororum, <laughs> okay. you can see here it's a colonial house and she took over a whole room and with dirt picked up from the streets, again, from the community around her, she created this beautiful a uh, carpet which reproduced one of William Morris's beautiful floral wallpapers. And at the end, she put one of her own paintings of a native uh, orchid from that area. In order to reach the painting and look at it, you had to walk through that room. And so you had to trace and partly destroy that carpet. But like all translations, that movement destroyed something and produced something else. And, and I think for me it's, it's, it's an important, and left traces as this was happening, traces of that process. You can look at the, the website if you want, but I think that is fundamental for me. So a few initiatives that we're doing, collectivity and collaboration. These communities are not only local, they're only virtual. Um, um, Marlon already mentioned the, uh, the Mitten network. It's a network that's very much alive and it's led by students and staff jointly. And it's about migration identity translation uh, across from Warwick in the UK and Monash in Australia, but also now incorporating others. And that, like my ping pong ball, has produced other things. So out of that network, some of the colleagues who were involved in that have now created Trans Collaborate, which is a, um, a voluntary organization which helps producing, like your translator-ton, um, uh, socially significant and valuable translation. We from Cardiff uh, launched a MOOC, ignore the 24th of October, the next one will run in February, on working with translation and that, the idea for that was to sensitize. Translation is too important to leave it to the specialists. We need to sensitize the users, so sensitize them as well. We've now had 38,000 plus people in 186 of those 193 countries taking this. And serendipity, so that's, that's the map of one of the runs, okay? And and serendipity again, I recently met a colleague with whom now we're working a lot more closely and she said, oh, I know you. And I was like, what? And she said, I see you on the MOOC all the time. Um, she has created a charity called Charity Translators, which again does something similar to what you are doing here. So they translate voluntarily for, um, for free. They translate uh, um, socially um, uh, relevant material. And she uses that MOOC now to train all her volunteers. So the chain that, 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 that carries on. And this has led to a variety of things. Salzburg Global Statement, again, I'm one of the signatories. Joe Bianco, whom I mentioned, is another one of those. But a statement for a multilingual world. Again, an influential organization which launched in 2018, um, in February 2018, this statement to support education and an ethos of multilingualism around the world. Uh, we've produced also a policy report about language education in particular in the UK but in the Anglophone world. But most of all for me, where it stops, where the bucket stops, as they say, is at this idea that we need to have a campaign against language <coughs> indifference. We have to sensitize every time we can, every time we have a chance, we have to sensitize people to the importance of language, to the, the fact that language is never transparent, that it is never neutral, that we have to pay attention to it. And that campaign starts at home. We're now trying to pressurize all the funding bodies in the UK to ask about the language, translation and interpreting implications of the research proposals they receive. Every time we see a, a proposal that says we're going to work in the periphery of a large um, UK city or uh, in the conflict areas of Central Africa and it does not say pray 
in what language are you going to do this? And if you're going to use interpreters and translators, have you thought about their role? Have you thought about the budget line about that? Have you thought about what it means ethically, professionally, and so on? That translation fails, sorry, that, that translation fails, and therefore that research fails to begin with. So what I want you to do is join the campaign against language indifference. Thank you. Sorry, I said it was going to be 50 minutes yeah. and I didn't manage to cut it. <laughs> Thank you for this very rich um, uh, and plentiful yeah. illustration of all the different ways of thinking about multiple realism and translation. Could you tell us a little bit more about the MOOC, um, sure. working on translation, um, what you include, how you are imagining the next iteration of the course as yeah. well? So um, we started when when I arrived. That was when I arrived at Cardiff. One of the first things I was told was, and by the way, we signed you up. Your new professor of translation study. We signed you up to do a MOOC uh, to train interpreters and translators online in four weeks. I was like, no, nah, don't think so. <laughs> okay. That's not possible. But we um, we talked about it with colleagues. So it's not just me. I, I I coordinated it, but it's designed by a team of colleagues. And we thought, okay, you know, the code word again was sensitization and the code word was raising awareness. Uh, we started with the idea of debunking myths, but that's a very negative way of thinking about things. We wanted to construct rather than, than work negatively. So we started with the classic four questions. What, who, where, how? And so we started asking, okay, what is translation? Who translates? Where does translation take place? And how do you judge a good or bad translation? And we built each week in that way. Um, this is not for credit. For us, it was, again, an exercise in sensitization, that's the code word, uh, and also in community building. And the community is amazing. Uh, we have a, a few thousand, you know, every time we have sort of anywhere between four, five, and nine, ten thousand people involved from all over the world. Some of them are experienced translators. Some of them are people who are vaguely thinking about it. Some are people who are just interested. Um, and, and it's phenomenal the way in which um, they sort of uh, both police, there's the wrong word, but, but sort of maintain the, the relationship in the community, but also add knowledge all the time. And for instance, in the first run, we had a huge blind spot. I was saying it earlier. We, we had tried to cover all kinds of languages, um, um, contexts, but we completely forgot, and we were talking about interpreting and translation, we forgot about sign language. And that community picked us up and said, you should have sign language in there. And then from the beginning also we wanted to speak uh, not from a fully anglophone and, and kind of central, um, which is with MOOCs it, it's a problem, you know, there's this idea that you're kind of beaming out from. And we didn't want that, so we're speaking very much from Cardiff. There's a lot of Welsh examples in there, and there's, there's Welsh speakers, and, and there is that, that sense that it's not, a, a, again, it's not about monolingualism, although the language we use is English, but it's, it's not about that. Um, we get people to do the craziest things, like translate uh, uh, from uh, Gilgamesh, which, of course, nobody can because they don't speak the language, but we get them to, to try and have a go at a phonetic translation of, of things like that. Um, and then from, from the third iteration onwards, we integrated the work that uh, I was doing in Namibia, and now we co-run and co-teach this MOOC with colleagues from the University of Namibia. So it speaks really from the north and south of the world, um, and, and that has been a phenomenal addition as well. It's really shifted um, our perspective and the way that people do it. Um, it's, it's interactive, but it's non-credit bearing, so it, it's, not, it's not about that. Uh, it's a lot of work when we run it, and, and people then, I know now that there are, you know, there are uh, colleagues, and I'm, and I very much welcome that, who have downloaded some of the material and are t using it to teach translation in Siberia, or, or as I said, or to, tr to train volunteers in, in a um, charity that has people worldwide. Um, so, I'm, you know, and we did a lot of focus groups as well to, to, to check what people wanted and what would be useful and what language we needed to use. So we've been very careful about how we speak and how we use language to talk about translation. And, and we think we've pitched it at the right level, but have a go, have a go. It's completely free. The only, you know, the only cost is, 
if people want to have access to all of the material after it ends, they, I think there's a, there's a fee that we don't charge, but the providers who are future learn, um, which was the old Open University, they, they, um, uh, they charge. And if, if people want a di diploma, which is a physical diploma that they have taken the course, Again, Future Learn sends it out, but it's not, you know, we don't do it as credit bearing. A number of students have come to us after that. You know, we have a number of students that come to do the MA with us, for instance, because they, they saw that and they thought, okay, I'm inspired by that. So, so that's, that's very useful. But more than anything, we've learned immensely from it, uh, massively. Do we have any other questions? Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I'm a PhD student in mm -hmm. linguistic anthropology, so I actually have many questions I hope to talk to you privately sure. about. But, um, you know, the idea of you know, what is a language, what is the standard language, what is the standard variety, um, that's something I was hoping you could elaborate on. Yes. Because there are a lot of, at least here in the U.S., mm. um, immigrant communities who yes. came from a specific region of the country, yep. so they speak a very regional um, dialect or variety yep. that does not you know, overlap with what is considered, you know, standard Italian for yeah, yeah. a lot of, you know, Sicilian communities here in the US sure. and then they the children or grandchildren learn Italian and they're like, oh, this is not how my grandmother or grandfather speaks. So they're yeah. learning the standard variety at home, their family's yeah. using it different. Yeah. So I was wondering if maybe you could elaborate on that in terms of translation of the different sure. varieties within yes. like yeah. languages. Yeah. Well, I mean, funnily enough, uh, the, the, the thing that, that um, gained me, a, 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 I'm sure, you know, sort of lifelong friendship with one of the colleagues um, who was the dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Namibia, was that the first time that we met, and he asked me something about that, and I said, well, you know the famous dictum, don't you, that a language is a dialect with an army and a foreign policy. Um, nobody can tell me who that is, you, who first said that. It gets attributed to somebody, but then when you check... Yeah, they say so, but then when you check, it seems that he said, as they say. So I'm not sure whether it's, it's true that, that it's him or not. So. He meant as Yiddish speakers. As Yiddish speakers. Okay, possibly. You're probably right. That's the, that's the closest attribution I have, but it's not clear whether it was already in Yiddish before he said it. But anyway, um, it is... And we tend not to use, for instance, the word dialect any longer because precisely of the implications and also the associations of that. Languages are always fluid, and they're always in fluidity, and, and that's another area where the translanguaging movement helps, because even, even that boundary, you know, because it's true, but it's also true that, for instance, the Neapolitan speakers of, you know, of second generation Italian-American sort of uh, ancestry, they're not only speaking Neapolitan, and even their Neapolitan is not pure Neapolitan, whatever pure Neapolitan might be. And if you go to Naples, you know, I'm sure you all do this. Where I grew up, I can hear the difference basically from one village to the next, five kilometers apart. And as kids, we used to tease each other about our accent in Tuscany, as monolingual as you get in, in terms of, you know, I grew up with the myth, again, another myth, that I was, um, a speaker of the standard Italian language, anybody who didn't speak like me got it wrong because I was from, you know, mid, lower middle class, Tuscany, that was the language of Dante. Of course it isn't, but never mind. But we could tease each other five kilometers apart. So that question, you know, we need to, to think about the mapping. And when you look at maps such as the one of Namibia, the one of Zambia, where it's also not strictly regional, you know, I had a map of Zambia there, I didn't stop over it, but the colleague who showed it, this to me was saying, this is the best one we have. But it's completely wrong, because it's much more complicated than this. Uh, and that's one of the problems, that as linguists, we're always complicating things. <laughs> and people would like to uncomplicate them. But for me, the way to think about that is to think much more in terms of dynamism and in terms of fluidity, rather than thinking about, can I put a tag, can I put a label on this and put it neatly into this box? Because language doesn't work that way. And that also influences the way we should think about language ecology, because again, it's not about preserving the panda. It's about preserving the overall ecology of languages and our attitude to languages alters that dramatically. So it's much more about attitudes than it is about can we codify the exact version of X, Y, Z. You know, even, even in Wales, 
um, as I said, I don't speak Welsh, but I, I live in a, in a bilingual country, which is in fact a multilingual country. And a lot of energy was spent, and to an extent is still spent, trying to determine which is the correct version of Welsh, which is the standard and so on. Fine, but that is really an academic, it's an academic and a political uh, um, project. The, the actual sociolinguistic project is to see how Welsh is transforming. And the word translanguaging, by the way, was created first in Welsh and to describe what Welsh speakers do. Because Welsh speakers are by now also, all of them, English speakers. There isn't anybody in Wales any longer who speaks only Welsh and doesn't speak any English. And so they're constantly moving between those languages. But they're not, here I am, I'm speaking Welsh, and now I, can, I will carefully code switch and, and, and drop one word and then move again. No, they just you know, meander across. I hear it all the time around the area where I live. So it's an answer, but it's not an answer. It, the question for me is to look at this in terms of the dynamics of, 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 and that changing map. And go to Brazil. Go to Brazil. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, thank you very much for this very enlightening and very uh, nice talk. Um, there is one part of your, uh, the first class that you showed that you're saying about the myths. Yes. We have uh, about language. And you said something specifically about the native language. Yeah. And as a translator uh, professor in training, <laughs> yes. we are always trying to achieve, it's not the native uh, language, but the naturalness. Yeah. Because we think that's a very important part of communication, yes. is that in some uh, situations that the text does not cause uh, the awkwardness. Yep. Uh, and you pay attention more to the language than to what you actually need to hear from the yep. you know, communication event. So how does that impact the, the, the teaching and the training yep. of translators? Yes. Is anyone working on that? Or do you, do you know if you need to try to incorporate that yeah. in the didactics of translation? Okay. Yeah. OK. Um, so start at the beginning. So. Um, Yes, of course. Uh, and and in, in, in translation and interpreting, of course, the myth of the native speaker goes even further because there is this sense that only, you know, that you should mostly or only translate into your native language and that uh, only very exceptionally people are capable of translating out of their native language and into another language and so on. Now, that may be so, but um, we have to be very careful because the other side of that is the assumption that, that you and I would never make, <laughs> we, know, we know it far too well, but that lots of people will make that therefore any native speaker can translate. And that if you are a native speaker, then you will be a good translator. Now, in a sense, the myth falls down precisely there because if it were a question of native, then any native speaker should be able to take a tech who has a good knowledge of whatever language, should be able to take that text and translate it into a perfectly natural text in their own language. But we know that that is far from being the case. It's a learned skill. What Anthony Pym, again, we were talking about it, you know, what Anthony Pym calls the fifth skill, fifth language skill. So it's a skill. And there are even, I, I didn't put it in these slides, I had far too many, but there's been some work done on the brain, you know, with, with brain um, resonance, showing what happens. The same brain, the same person, when they're asked to, to act as bilinguals, and then when they're actually asked to translate. And you see different connectivities lighting up. So we know that there are different processes. So in terms of the, um, the, the teaching, um, I, I know there are people who are working uh, more broadly on, on these issues, but there's a whole uh, movement and there was research. I was, I, I should, I'm terrible with names, um, but I should remember, but I was asked recently to fill in a questionnaire, for instance, for research, yeah, research that, that people were doing on, on whether we within our own universities teach only in one direction, for instance, and, and train people only to teach into their native language, or whether we also teach uh, translation in the other direction and so on. So there is work that is being done. Uh, personally, one of the things that I've most enjoyed doing, and, and I still do it, uh, while I was at Warwick together with Maureen Freely, um, um, one of the leading translation translators for Turkish, she's one of the translators of Pamuk and so on, um, and, and 
also with another colleague, Chantal Wright, who's written a fantastic book about the, the, the pedagogy of, of um, in particular, literary translation. We set up a, a course which was called um, uh, Translation as Literary Practice. And in that module, which I now also teach, but teach as translation as creative practice, so it's not limited to literature in, in Cardiff, um, we ask people to translate into English, which is the shared language, even though it may not be their native language. But also what we do, and this is something that Larry Venuti has written about, we then ask people to look at the translation in itself. So we don't look at the source text. The source text is there, and there's always someone else in the classroom who can also access it, beside the person who, who did it. But we ask people to concentrate on the target text, on the translated text, and say, this is interesting. Did you do this intentionally? Or is this, you know, because, you know, so there was there something awkward or something particular mm -hmm. in the source text? So when we need to, we go back. But that also does something else for me, which is equally important. That naturalness means that often, as translators, we desperately want, and it's an instinct, we want to normalize a text, we want to standardize it, we want to iron out all the awkwardness, we want to iron out the ambiguity. And this is a problem, because texts may well be intentionally ambiguous, or may be intentionally awkward. And, and so that's a problem, and we have to teach that, as you will know, to our students. Yeah, and, and, and everything else, exactly. But it's also, you know, I, I once spent an hour listening to a colleague who was um, sort of doing, you know, a whole um, sort of philological, very detailed philological study of the history of the text, was trying to disambiguate a passage from one of Boccaccio's Latin works, uh, which had been read in one way and in another way. She was looking at source text, she was looking at all the traditional translations, the commentaries, and at the end of it, and it was fascinating, I just raised my hand and I said, could we consider the possibility that Boccaccio wanted to be ambiguous? Because we are, you know, translation is a form of hermeneutics. You know, again, you and I will know, translation is a form of hermeneutics and is a form of, of very, very close reading. And as readers, we want to get to the bottom of it. But what if? So the other side of what you're describing is also the fact that that naturalness sometimes leads us to normalize things that we perhaps shouldn't normalize. Thank you. Any last question, perhaps? I actually have one, one quick one. You have one. <laughs> um, like you mentioned something about um, uh, using uh, translation and narrativity for your training of healthcare workers in yes. Africa. I wonder if you uh, are able to give us like more details about that. Uh, like you mentioned it in passing, and, 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 yes. and that thing about pain, and I remember the yes. uh, conference that we had in Australia to launch uh, the, yeah. uh, like the Midden Initiative back in the day. So I, I wonder yeah. if you can give us like more examples. Okay. Uh, narrativity is where we're going. So far, we've done it in different ways. So we've used um, sort of performance techniques, theater techniques, and you know, role plays, simulations, and so on. And we've, we've used them literally with groups of students, you know, um, one doctor, so they're all medical students, but one's a doctor, one's a patient, one is the, the interpreter. Uh, we give them leeway to organize the space however they want. We have multiple groups in the same room, and then there's always um, at least a couple who are observing each of the groups, and then you start asking questions afterwards, and that's where those comments came from. Um, and and the, the most interesting things come out, so um, questions such as, you know, if you're the doctor and, you know, if, if if, if, okay, if, you, if you're the doctor, you're the interpreter, she's the patient, at the end you, know, you ask the other, so during the conversation, who was the doctor looking at? Was he, she looking at the interpreter, was she looking at the patient? How much body language, et cetera, et cetera, talking about pain, for instance, would you have missed if you were staring at the interpreter and not at the, the doctor? But also the question of neutrality. In one case, at one point, we were in this big room, you know, big like this, and at the end, down there, I heard one of the girls, so the, the students, sorry, I shouldn't say girls, one of the, the students who were, uh, she happened to be a, a female student, screaming at the top of her voice, you can't possibly do that. We've had a whole conversation about neutrality and the fact that these all thought that, you know, as an interpreter, you have to be objective and you can't, you know, intervene, etc., etc. And then she screamed, you can't possibly do that. So I went down there and I went, what's going on? She said, and she said, okay, he's been asking her a question. So one was the pharmacist in this case, you know, and, and the patient. He's been asking her questions, you know, I was translating. He's been asking her a question. She said that she's, um, you know, she's, she's got a stomach upset, she's, you know, and... He's now assumed that she is pregnant 
but he hasn't even asked her whether she's been sexually active. And at that point, she started screaming, you know, you can't possibly do that, as the interpreter was intervening into the, into the dialogue. So it's really interesting to see at which point, you know, this whole thing about neutrality, for instance, you have to say, wait a minute, something is going completely wrong here. I need to actually intervene. So there are all kinds of things that come up. And you could say that these narrati are narratives in that sense. You know, they, they are um, about also the way in which you do relationality and so on. But narrativity is where we want to go next. So um, if we get, we, we've applied from some Commonwealth fellowships. Uh, we have colleagues from Zambia, Uganda, and, and um, uh, Namibia, I hope, you know, but we're at the very, very last stage. I hope that, that we get them. If we do, they'll be coming to Cardiff for about six weeks. And we'll be working on precisely putting together the bid for another research project, which would be precisely about that. How do we work with communities to see what the most effective way of doing public health communication is? And, and that's where the question of narrative, the question of the specialist or non-specialist language, the question of prestige, all those questions that I had there then come in. Um, and at the same time, we're hope, hoping to also work jointly with no, not just us in Cardiff, but with three uh, uh, universities from Sub-Saharan Africa to work on setting up um, individual um, um, programs in, in uh, interpreting and translation for those countries, for those institutions, which will be the first in-country training for interpreters and translators. But it needs to be tailored to the needs of that particular community, so we, we're hoping to work on that as well. Um, but if you don't have those narratives, if you don't have that way of communicating with the communities, then none of this is effective. You end up setting up, you know, in Italian we call them cathedrals in the desert for a while. You, you set up things that don't attract any attention and they don't function. So that's uh, part, of the, part of the job. Nothing is short with me, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think we can, uh, you can join me in thanking Loredana for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. I'm sure that we'll have the opportunity to talk to her. And, and, and good luck with all your initiatives and I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll be following them and, um, and I'm envious as I said. Obrigado.